to motivate today's lecture, let's look at a famous historical case of operations research. In the Second World War, the Allies executed many bombing runs, and often their planes came back looking like this. To investigate where they should reinforce their planes, investigators made a tally of the most common points on the plane where they were seeing damage. That looked like this. The initial instinct was to reinforce those places that registered the most hits. However, it was soon pointed out by a man called Abraham Wald that this ignores a crucial aspect of the source of the data. They weren't tallying where planes were most likely to be hit, they were tallying where planes were most likely to be hit and come back. The places where they weren't seeing any hits were exactly the places that should be reinforced, since the planes that were hit there didn't make it back. The specific effect is called survivorship bias, and it's worth keeping in mind. But the more general lesson for today is that you should not take your data at face value. Don't just load your data into an ML model and check the predictive performance. Consider what you're ultimately trying to achieve and consider how the source of your data will affect that goal. Imagine that I gave you four data sets, each with two features, X and Y. For all data sets, all of the following statistics give the same value. The mean and variance of X, the mean and variance of Y, the correlation between X and Y, the parameters of the linear regression line that best fits, and the R squared of the correlation. Given this, you would conclude that these four data sets are pretty similar, right? This illustrates an important aspect of not taking the data at face value, which is that you should look at your data. These are the four data sets from the previous slide. They are a common example called Anscombe's Quartet. Only when we look at the data do we see how different they are. More importantly, only when we look at the data do we see the patterns that define them. These are the patterns that we want to get at if we want to understand the data. And none of these are revealed by the descriptive statistics of the previous slides. Here's a more modern variant, the data source doesn't. And you can follow the link given here to read more about this kind of example. In machine learning and data science, our data sets are rarely two-dimensional. So we don't have the luxury of simply doing a scatter plot. Looking at our data in a way that provides insight almost always requires a lot of ingenuity and creativity. For high dimensional multivariate data of the kind we've been dealing with so far, a good place to start is to produce a scatter plot matrix. This is simply a large grid of every scatter plot you can produce between any two features in your data. And often only the plots below or above the diagonal are shown. The scatterplot matrix gives you a good idea of how the features relate to each other. If you have a target value, like a class or a regression target, it's a good idea to include it among the features for the scatterplot matrix. That way, you can see what relation each feature has with the target in isolation from the other features. On the right, we see the data as a 3D point cloud in blue, together with the three projections to two dimensions in yellow, red, and green that the scatterplot matrix gives us. In the rest of this video, we'll look at ways you can clean up your data. We'll look at ways you can clean up your data to make it usable for a classification or a regression task. And we'll start by dealing with missing values. Quite often, your data will look like this. For a lot of cells in your data matrix, the values will not be available. This is something you will need to deal with before any machine learning algorithm will accept this data. There's also the problem of missing labels. In some cases, even values from the target column are missing, and this requires a slightly different approach than missing values in the feature columns. If you have missing values in one of your features, the simplest way to get rid of them is to just remove the features for which the values are missing. If you're lucky, the feature is not that important anyway. You can also remove the instances with missing data, but here you have to be careful. If the data was not corrupted uniformly, removing rows with missing values will change your data distribution. For example, you might have data gathered by volunteers in the street using some electronic equipment. If the volunteer in Amsterdam has problems with their hardware, then their data will contain missing values and the collected data will not be representative of Amsterdam. Another way you might get non-uniformly distributed missing data is if your data comes from a questionnaire where people sometimes refuse to answer certain questions. For instance, if only rich people refuse to answer questions about their taxes, removing these instances will remove a lot of rich people from your data and give you a different distribution.
So how do you tell if data is missing uniformly? There's no surefire way, but usually you can get a good idea by plotting a histogram of how much data is missing against some other feature. For instance, if the number of instances with missing features against income is very different from the regular histogram over income, you can assume that your data was not corrupted uniformly. Before we move on, let's zoom out a little bit. Whenever you have a question about how to approach something like this, it's best to think about the real-world setting where you might apply your trained model. We often call this production, a term used in software development for the system that will be running the final deployed version of the software. That is where some machine learning models end up, but we might also use machine learning models to perform business analytics, clinical decision support, or in a scientific experiment. Wherever your model is meant to end up after you've finished your experiment, that's what we'll call production. And production is what you're trying to simulate when you train your model and test it on a test set. So the choices you make should make your experiment as close of a simulation of your production setting as you can manage. For example, in the case of missing values, the big question is, can you expect missing data in production? Or will production data be clean and are the test data just noisy because the production environment isn't ready yet? Examples of production systems that should expect missing data are situations where data comes in from a web form with optional values or situations where data is merged from different sources, like online forms and phone surveys. You may even find yourself in a situation where the test data has no missing values, since it was carefully gathered, but the production system will have missing values because the data will come from a web form. In that case, you may want to introduce missing values artificially in your test data to simulate the production setting and study the effect of the missing data. So remember, whenever you're stuck on how to process your data, think what the production setting is that you're trying to simulate and make your choices based on that. So back to the missing values. If you expect to see missing values in production, then your model needs to be able to consume missing values and you should keep them in the test set. For, categor for categorical features, the easiest way to do this is to add a category for missing values. And for numeric features, we'll see some options in the next slide. If your production setting won't have missing values, then that's the setting you want to simulate. If at all possible, you should get a test set without missing values, even if the training set does have them. You can then freely test what method of dealing with the missing training values gives you the best performance on the test set. If you cannot get a test set without missing values, one thing you can do is to report performance on both the data that has the instances with missing values removed and the data that has the missing values filled in by some mechanism. Neither are ideal simulations of the production setting, but the combination of both numbers hopefully gives you some idea. So at some point, either in the training data or the test data, we will probably need to fill in the missing values. This is called imputation. A simple way to do this in categorical data is to use the mode, the most common category. For numerical data, the mean or the median are simple options. We'll look at when you should use which later in this video. A more involved but more powerful way is to predict the missing value from the other features. You just turn the feature column into a target column and train a classifier for categoric features and a regression model for numeric features. If your target label has missing values, the story is a little different. In the training set, you are free to do whatever you think is best. You can remove instances or impute the missing labels. If you have a lot of missing labels, then you essentially have a semi-supervised learning setting, as we saw in the first lecture. On the test set, however, you shouldn't impute or ignore the missing values, since that changes the task and most likely makes it easier which will give you false confidence in the performance of your model. Instead, you should report the uncertainty created by the missing values. In classification, this is easy. You compute the accuracy under the assumption that your classifier gets all missing values correct and under the assumption that it gets all missing values wrong. This gives you a best case and a worst case scenario respectively. Your true accuracy on the test set is somewhere in between. Another problem that we need to worry about is outliers. Values in our data that take on unusual and unexpected values. Outliers come in different shapes and sizes. The most important question 
is whether your outliers are natural or unnatural. In this case, the six dots to the right are so oddly and mechanically aligned that we are probably looking at some measurement error. Perhaps someone is using the value minus one for missing data. We can remove these or interpret them as missing data and use the approaches just discussed. In other cases, however, the outlier is very much part of the distribution. This is what we call a natural outlier. Bill Gates may have a million times the net worth of anybody you are likely to meet in the street, but that doesn't mean he isn't part of the distribution of income. If we fit a normal distribution to this data, the outlier would ruin our fit. But that's because the data isn't normally distributed. What we should do here is recognize that fact and adapt our model, for instance, by removing assumptions of normally distributed data. Here is a metaphor for natural and unnatural outliers. If our instances are images of faces, the image on the left, that of comedian Marty Feldman, is an extreme of our data distribution. It looks unusual, but it's crucial in fitting a model to this data set. The image on the right is clearly corrupted data. It tells us nothing about what human faces might look like, and we're better off removing it from the data. However, remember the real-world use case. If we can expect corrupted data in production as well, then we should either train the model to deal with it or clean it automatically in production as well. This would require us to have some way to detect automatically whether something is an outlier. If the outliers are rare and we have a lot of data, it may just be easier to leave them in and hope that the model can learn to work around them, even if they are unnatural outliers. So if your outliers are mistakes, unnatural outliers, then you should deal with them. And if not, then you should leave them be. But you should make sure that your model doesn't make assumptions of normality. If you can expect them in production, then you should make sure that your model can deal with them. And if not, then you should remove them and get a test set that represents the production situation. Let's look a little bit closer at this assumption of normality. This is more common than you might think. To illustrate, let's try and learn a very simple thing. Which single value best represents our data? We choose a value m, compute the distance to all our data points, the residuals, and try to minimize their squares, as we've done before. This is a one-dimensional version of the linear regression model that we've uh, looked at in the second lecture. And the only assumption we've made here is that of squared errors. So this is the function that we're trying to minimize. We'll take the derivative of this objective function and set it equal to zero. There's no need for gradient descent here. We'll just solve the problem analytically. We can take the sum symbol out of the gradient and set the result equal to zero. We apply the chain rule as we did in the second lecture, which gives us these two factors. The first factor, we take the gradient by moving the two from the exponent out in front. And in the second factor, we see that there are two terms, only one of which depends on m. So we get the partial derivative of m over m, which is one, which gives us this result. In this case, remember that the x's are given and we're looking for the value of m, so we'll solve for m. First thing we do is remove the two, because for the expression on the left-hand side to be equal to zero, the thing that we multiply two by also needs to be zero. We break up the sum symbol into two sum symbols, one that sums all the values in our data, and one that sums n copies of m, which rewrites to this. And then moving everything to the right-hand side gives us this expression for our optimal m, which you may recognize as the definition of the mean of our data. So the assumption of squared errors leads directly to the use of the mean as a representative example of a set of points. And we can now see why the assumption of squared errors is so disastrous in the case of the income distribution. If Bill Gates makes a million times as much as the next person in the data set, he is not pulling on the mean a million times as much, he is pulling 10 to the power of 12 times as much. Hence the joke. A billionaire walks into a homeless shelter and says, what a bunch of freeloaders. The average wealth in this place is more than a million dollars. To get rid of the normality assumption, or rather replace it by another assumption, we can use the mean absolute error instead. Here we take the residuals, but we sum their absolute value instead of their squared value. That is, if they are positive, we just take the positive value, 
If they're negative, we remove the minus sign. If they're negative, we remove the minus sign. So which is the most representative value that minimizes this error? To solve this problem, we proceed in the same way. We work out the derivative of this error function, set it equal to zero, and solve for m. Again, we start by working the sum symbol out of the derivative, and to deal with the absolute function, we can apply the chain rule again. On the left, we have the derivative of the absolute function, which we need to work out. And the function looks like this. On the right-hand side of the vertical axis, it's just the identity function. And on the left-hand side of the vertical axis, it's the mirror image of the identity function. This means that on the right-hand side, if the argument is positive, the derivative is 1. And on the left-hand side, if the argument is negative, the derivative is minus 1. And this function, that returns 1 if the argument is positive and minus 1 if the argument is negative, is called the sine function, which looks like this. Note that, as before, the second factor after the chain rule becomes 1, so that disappears from the expression. So any value of m, for which the left-hand side of this equation evaluates to 0, gives us the lowest mean absolute error for our problem. To see which value that is, note that this sum consists only of plus 1s and minus 1s. So to get a 0, we need an equal number of plus 1s and minus 1s. And we get a plus 1 if xi is less than m, and a minus 1 if xi is greater than m. So to get the optimal m, we need as many x's that are less than m as x's that are greater than m. In other words, m needs to be a point, m needs to be a point with as many instances to its left as to its right, which is a definition of the median. In short, if we optimize the mean squared error, we get the mean, and if we optimize the mean absolute error, we get the median. This mistake of using the mean when a normal distribution is not an appropriate assumption is sadly very common. For example, you might hear someone say something like, there's no poverty in the US, it's the third richest country in the world by average personal wealth. Wikipedia allows us to fact check this quickly, and it is indeed true. But remember that Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos live in the US, and as we saw, they have a pretty strong pull on the mean. Luckily, Wikipedia also allows us to sort the same list by median wealth. If we do that, we see that the US suddenly drops to 22nd place. The Netherlands, incidentally, drops down from 12 to 34. So there's plenty of income inequality over here as well. Here's an example of this fallacy in the wild. In 2019, there was a discussion in the US about unionization in the games industry. Here, one of the heads of Take-Two suggests that because the average yearly salary for game developers has six figures, unions are unlikely. Whether rich people can benefit from unions is a question for a different series of lectures, but the fact that the average wages are high most likely just means that there is a small number of very rich people in the industry. We'd need to know the median to be sure. So, if you want to adapt your model to deal with natural outliers, beware of hidden assumptions of normality. Consider modeling your noise with a heavy-tailed distribution instead. In other words, one which makes outliers more likely. Using the median instead of the mean is one way to do this. If you are doing regression and your target label is non-normally distributed, then you can use the sum of absolute errors as a loss function instead of the sum of squared errors, as we've been doing so far. This will also implicitly assume a more heavy-tailed distribution than the normal, but even more heavily tailed distributions are available. In the next video, we'll look at some more aspects of data pre-processing. Specifically, we'll look at the question of how to deal with class imbalance, and we'll look at a neat trick that will allow you to improve the expressiveness of a linear model without changing the difficulty of fitting it to your data.